Good evening, and welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's public program, Safeguarding History, Trailblazing Adventures Inside the Worlds of Collecting and Forging History, with Kenneth W. Rendell. We are here in Worcester, in Antiquarian Hall, with a robust audience watching us virtually on YouTube as well. We're on the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain a vibrant presence here in central Massachusetts. I'm Scott Casper, president of AAS. We have a few newcomers here this evening and also newcomers on YouTube. So I'll just say a few words about the American Antiquarian Society, a national research library in Worcester, Massachusetts. Our mission is to cultivate a deeper understanding of the American past, grounded in our ever-growing collection of printed and manuscript sources. The society fosters a broad community of inquiry through inclusive programs and robust support for scholarship. We welcome readers from around the country and around the world, as well as right here in Worcester, to use our collections, whether here in Antiquarian Hall or digitally on our website. This program tonight is being recorded and will be available afterward on our YouTube page. So please recommend it to friends or watch it again if you'd like. We thank you for joining us this evening. And as a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support that you can provide to help keep this work going. Thank you. Since our founding in 1812, the American Antiquarian Society has enjoyed close relationships with collectors of printed and manuscript materials. Our founder, Isaiah Thomas, was one such collector. He amassed the printed record of the new United States, its newspapers and its pamphlets, as well as its books. And his collection became AAS's founding library, beginning with 2,650 titles and augmented until his death. Also in our early decades, Hannah Mather Crocker was AAS's most frequent donor after Thomas bringing to the society a, sub a substantial portion of the Mather Family Library, as well as significant manuscript materials and books. The story of the collectors who have helped build AAS collections is told in the exhibition catalog In Pursuit of a Vision, which was based on a Grolier Club exhibition in the, organized for our bicentennial in 2012. And the names of the collectors in that book are familiar names of collectors, like Charles Henry Taylor and Thomas W. Streeter, and many others who may be less familiar, but who contributed importantly to scholarship, bibliography, and collecting in specific fields, from Louisiana imprints to ephemera to children's literature. So tonight, it is a special pleasure to welcome back to AAS one of the great collectors and dealers of the past 60 years, who has just written a memoir. Ken Rendell started in rare coins in the 1950s when he was 10 years old, 10 years old. He was a dealer by age 12, featured in the local newspaper, the Somerville Journal. I can't possibly summarize all he has accomplished since then. Read the book. But I will say that he moved early into the realm of historical documents and built a business that had ultimately galleries in New York, Beverly Hills, and Tokyo. As a leading expert on manuscripts, he's also been a leader in the forensic examination of documents, much sought after to identify the authenticity, or lack thereof, of materials ranging from the so-called Hitler diaries to the so-called Jack the Ripper diary. Ken Rendell is also a significant collector, notably of Western Americana and of World War II materials and artifacts, which he has collected since the late 1950s. He established the International Museum of World War II near Boston, which for more than a decade presented exhibitions on the many aspects of that brutal global conflict. And Ken Rendell is a prolific author. This is at least his 10th book, not counting those he's co-edited. He wrote The Standard Guides, Forging History, The Detection of Fake Letters and Documents, and History Comes to Life, Collecting Historical Letters and Documents, several books about World War II, and also The Great American West, Pursuing the American Dream. And that's enough from me, because nobody can tell Ken Rendell's story better than he can. It's a delight to welcome you back to AAS, Ken, to welcome uh, Ken's wife, Shirley Rendell, and to welcome you to the podium to talk not necessarily about what's in the book, but maybe some of the stories behind the book. Welcome, Ken.
Thank you all for coming. Um, I wanted to make this into a personal talk um, because if you want to know what's in the book, you can read the book. Um, and it, this is kind of a unique talk for me um, because this is a unique group. Uh, collectors um, who are interested in history are interested in more than themselves. And the original books really bring you close to the subject. Uh, a first edition is whatever the author saw in their lifetime. The dust jacket represents what their uh, concept of the book is. Um, manuscripts, which has been my field basically, bring you even closer, closer to the author. Uh, their ed edits tell you so much about their development, uh, what they didn't write, uh, avenues that they went down. Um, and original letters really tell you everything about the people, their thoughts and, and their concerns, anxieties, and te they tell you the reality. Um, basically, I've always been fascinated with people. Um, in my memoir, I did say that I grew up in what was described as the most densely populated town in America, or city, uh, Somerville. And uh, we had a two-family house with six families. And it was post-World War II, and there was a housing shortage. Um, and rather than get involved in all the neighborhood arguments, fights, and everything else, I decided to try to understand people as people. and. Um, it actually w was tremendously helpful uh, in life uh, to look at everybody uh, individually. Um, the biggest reason to, um, to do the memoir was that I wanted people to know how things happened. And my wife said at one point that I, the outcomes of a lot of things I did were really well known. What nobody really knew was how they happened and, and what was behind it. Uh, anxiety, uh, chronic uh, paranoia about forgeries, um, the enormous amount of time that went into researching material and situations. Um, I would frequently be asked at antiquarian book fairs if something was genuine and told it would only take a minute. And I'd always say, well, if it only takes a minute, then you're going to be wrong. Um, it takes a long time to prove something is genuine, actually. Um, it, you can prove it's fake if something's really wrong, like the paper's wrong, the, the, write, the writing materials are wrong. Um, but they were always shocked at what really went into things. They thought I'd know instantly. Um, but it didn't really work that way. Um, I wanted to tell, what, talk in my memoir, what was behind all of this? You know, why were the galleries successful? Uh, the big journalistic frauds, uh, like Jack the Ripper, which was a joke. Um, but it was printed by Warner Books. Um, and tax court cases, which, which people know the outcome, um, but not how, um, how it was arrived at in criminal trials, um, which were not pleasant. Um, and I only got involved. I, I was never an advocate. I had an opinion, and whether you liked it or not, I had to be paid for the opinion. And um, if I went to court, that was fine, but I didn't advocate positions. Um, but many of my publishers over the years, and I've had a whole array from starting with University of Oklahoma Press uh, to National Geographic, uh, which did two books, um, they wanted to focus on the adventures, on the outcomes. Um, and I couldn't imagine anything worse than doing that. It, it's, you know, they termed, uh, they, Simon and Schuster wrote the cover for my book, which is a great dust jacket. And they came up with adventures, and, and, and I like the jacket. I can't complain about it. Um, but they, everyone saw it as an entertainment value. Um, and that I, I don't have, didn't have time for that kind of thing. Um, and this is only the second talk that I'm doing about the book. I mean, this is it. Uh, Scott said to me, was I doing a book tour? I couldn't imagine anything worse. Um, <laughs> 
And, um, and, and I haven't done, I, I did, I've never heard a podcast, but I have now appeared in three of them. Um, so I've got some experience now. I, I used to have to ask my daughter what things like that were. Um, but what really changed my mind um, about doing the book was that I have an educational uh, foundation, a private foundation in Somerville um, for uh, poor kids growing up right where I grew up, um, doing really well in school. Um, it's called the Spark Foundation, and they bring the spark, and I want to open doors. Um, and we provide educational opportunities for these kids to really understand that they're really up to it. They can go to a good college. They're doing really well. But it, it is probably not amazing, but I guess it was amazing to me personally um, just how narrow their world is, ethnically and financially. They're in a ghetto. And um, I wanted to get them out of the ghetto. And I, I remember the first year there was a girl at... She was going to go to a program for the summer in Wellesley College. It could have been Mars, as far as she was concerned. These kids have never been any place except Somerville. And um, the, um, the success of this program uh, has been terrific. I wish I could get other people to do things like this. Um, but I started to really talk to these kids about my life and what I did and uh, and I walked the same streets, and my family was desperately poor. And to encourage them um, to try things, um, and uh, that that I ended up doing awfully well uh, without fantastic uh, formal education. And I wanted them to, since they could get scholarships, presumably for good these good schools. Uh, but they needed to feel that they could do it. Um, th that was very much um, what I wanted to put across in this book. Um, that it, it also really irritated me um, the way people think success is luck. You know, I'd really be working my butt off and somebody would say, oh, you're so lucky. You know, it just, it just happens to you. Well, that's not true. Um, so I wanted to, to talk about uh, in the book public successes, things where, where I did a big tax court case. And it was the first time um, that, a ta that a judge found 100% for one side. I mean, the normal thing is the judge doesn't understand why anybody wants any archives anyhow. Um, so you've got two different opinions, so split it down the middle. That's what always happened. Um, and it, I think, didn't matter what you said. Um, but I, in, in reliving this, and, and I think a key to doing the book, um, COVID helped. It took eight, to eight um, months to write this. I could hyper-focus, but I wanted to go back, and I didn't want to write from the standpoint of today, talking about something that happened. I really wanted to go back to the feelings at the time. I wanted to go and find myself at that age, and that was really a, a really uh, interesting journey. Um, the, um, the anxiety in, in so many of these situations um, just kind of went, it went by the boards um, because you had the focus on, on the outcome. Um, but how, how they got to that um, point. Um, and I also wanted to describe my business and, and how I built it because I wanted to encourage other people uh, who don't have any money um, in in developing areas in collecting because without dealers, there, there aren't any collectors. And dealers really are the key to things being preserved because if it's not worth any money, um, that, then you have to rely on people understanding why something's important and bringing it here or bringing it to another institution. Uh, but if there's money involved, people will save it. And... Um, they'll recognize it. 
And so I wanted to write in, in really minute detail um, of a time when there were no such thing as photocopiers. Uh, there were no fax machines. There was no internet. There were no office computers. Um, so you had to really be excited by the material. There was a lot of work involved. Um, a real key thing that I talked about uh, in the book uh, is going to see people. Um, I didn't have any money and I didn't have any inventory, um, but I did have a mailing list from the Manuscript Society and just about everybody um, was a member of that. And um, I wrote to people who I knew were collectors and everybody, everyone wanted to see me. Um, it was like a fellowship. They um, it was just amazing. I mean, um, one of the people who I knew was a big and important collector in Chicago, and I'm staying at a campground in Indiana Dune State Park, um, and I drive into Chicago to meet him, and I can't find his office, 3900 South Michigan Avenue. And I'm driving back and forth in this, this brick wall, and I just can't figure it out. You know, where the hell could his office be? And then I see in the middle of the brick wall, over the, this huge entrance, it was 3,900. It was an industrial complex. And it was the biggest dairy in the Midwest. Biggest maker of ice cream, but also pharmaceutical wholesaling. And, you know, this guy was really on top of the world. He spent most of the day with me, talking about his collection. Um, what he did, um, it, it really gave me um, such a, a, um, a welcoming, and I, I got this everywhere I went. It, it, uh, but I was providing, um, in a sense, a, an audience for them. You know, they never met other people. If they didn't go to New York, they didn't see a dealer. Uh, and people did catalogs, printed catalogs, but they didn't make individual offers. Uh, I mean, it was a real pain in the days of typing with a normal typewriter to make corrections, and you'd have carbon copies, and there were no, uh, it's almost an unbelievable world. Um, the, um, the, the key behind our galleries, um, mainly New York, that was the, the, the really important one, um, was to bring things to people who never thought they could afford it they, or never even thought they could ever have it. Um, the um, the t foot traffic that we had, it was very planned. I mean, really very uh, thought out in detail. Um, <clears throat> we had really good foot traffic where we were, very high end. Uh, but the owner um, of the building wanted to have some good stores not just more jewelry stores and so on. Um, so we got the, the gallery uh, on Madison Avenue at 76th Street almost on the basis of what we could afford, you know, what made sense to us. And then as we did better and leases came up, uh, but we still were paying about half. I mean, it was still 500000 a year. Uh, so it was very real money. Um, the, uh, I was really sorry we couldn't continue it, but um, we really, the rent went up, the building was sold, and our rent went up to over a million and a half. And as I explained to the landlord, even if I forge everything, <laughs> and we have no cost of goods sold, um, it would be a real struggle with salaries and so on. Um, so I thought getting into my past, this is what I'd be writing about. This is my goal. My goal is to tell young dealers, you know, how you can do it. Um, and the, the, that, that's true. Um, but the, what, what amazed me was how much I got out of doing this. And what a good experience it was for me, even if nobody read the book. Uh, I, re I read the book. Um, and it just was a much deeper experience than anything I ever expe I expected. Um, and part of the, 
um, way the book unfolded well was that as a real collector, I had saved souvenirs of different things. And um, I to think my way back into things was really helped by the fact I had things. Uh, in the book is a map of, of Paramount Studios lot and with my notes as to where different things were. Uh, and I had just saved it um, along with a hat, I think, that says Paramount Studios on it. Um, and But it was really good. I could think my way back in. And I think I wrote about what it was like to go through the enormous gates of Paramount Studios, which is very impressive. Um, and um, I also went to different places. I, I worked on Sacco Vanzetti. Um, uh, the defense papers, and it was everything, and they'd been sealed um, for 75 years, and I opened them at Boston Public Library and, and did an appraisal of them. Um, and I went back to the courthouse in Dedham where they were tried, and the courtroom is still there, virtually unchanged. So as much as I could, I, I revisited things. Um, and I, I didn't go back to tax court um, but I relived the whole thing from newspaper clippings and so on. Um, I was 31 years old. I was representing the Internal Revenue Service, uh, probably because they couldn't get anybody else, um, against the very popular former governor of Illinois, Otto Kerner, uh, who also chaired Lyndon Johnson's Violence in American Cities Commission. Um, and that, it was the opposing appraiser um, was a guy who inflated everything about himself. And I knew that his value would be inflated. Um, but, you know, he'd been in business for 40 years or 50 years, and I'd been in business for 10 or 12 years. So it was a real uphill battle. But I remember the, the prosecutor for the IRS saying to me, you know, it's just going to be one word against the other. And, um, and we weren't actually far apart at all on value, but he wouldn't, they wouldn't settle, which we didn't quite understand because there wasn't a lot of money involved for anybody, but the IRS wouldn't back down. And what I did was I thought that what's really wrong so often is dealers just say, well, it's that because I know it. You know, I know it's genuine. Uh, you know, I know it's worth 25000 Well, there is something behind that. And even though you have a quick opinion, um, like with forgeries, your, your mind is reflecting off of, you know, if somebody says this document's from 1700 um, and somebody did it in, in 1900, you instantly know it. The paper's the wrong color, the texture, and so on. Um, and I wanted to be able to really explain how I arrived at what I did. So I did a very analytical um, report on value. And, and I testified about all of this. Um, whereas the other guy, he did just say, well, I've done this for 50 years, and I know that's worth, it's worth 75000 um, and I, I wasn't overwhelmed at the prospect of appearing uh, in court. I had appeared one time before in what was an organized crime case, but I didn't know it. I testified um, f on value uh, and, but it, and of postage stamps that weren't worth much of anything, but Franklin Roosevelt had signed them all, and it, was, it gave the FBI jurisdiction because they were stolen. So the, the defense was that uh, they didn't have jurisdiction. It wasn't worth enough money. And I didn't find out until years later it was a put-up job uh, by organized crime. But w in this case, um, the, the other side had a, a very, very good lawyer from Washington. There was no question. Money had nothing to do with it. Um, but I presented my whole case. It was a woman judge, which gave, was a huge advantage because... Uh, she saw nuances, and um, and she really listened to what I was saying. Um, and the other guy had appraised Nixon's gubernatorial papers, 
uh, and in Lyndon Johnson's White House papers. The White House paper case was overthrown on value, uh, and he got to prison time for backdating Nixon's gubernatorial papers. So, I mean, this was the kind of guy uh, that he was. But he was wonderful pontificating about value and, and how important he was. Um, but the, what I mainly remembered in that case was the, um, I wouldn't give an inch on cross-examination. And I was, um, I, I had studied enough to know all the tricks. Um, and we started out um, with the opposing lawyer asked if I was an historian. Well, that's a trap. Because whatever I, if I say yes, now he'll start attacking whatever my definition. So I told him he had to define it. And I think that went back and forth 10 times. And finally, he defined in the story. And I said, yes, I am. So it, it kind of went like this. And um, he uh, really tried to get me going on education. And uh, afterwards, after all of this was, uh, uh, after cross-examination was finished, um, he said to me, he said, there's one question I wanted to ask you, but I just didn't get to it. Oh, I said, you, you, were, you were fishing around to see, you know, how far you could go with me. I said, uh, you, got, you got to it, but you didn't ask it. And uh, he said, yeah, in, in who's who, there's nothing about your education. I said, I know. And he said, I was afraid to ask you because I figure you have a PhD in history from Harvard. He said, do you? And I said, you're young enough, and I'm young enough that we'll meet again. See if you have the nerve next time. Um, but that, that turned out really well. The judge took what I wrote as to how I did it and issued it as her opinion. And then that became the um, standard for the IRS and the, and the Society of American Archivists, that you really had to break things down. It wasn't a big guessing game. You know, Archives have different values in different sections. Um, and you, you really can um, quantify it. You can argue the, you know, the value of the quantification, but um, um, one of the things that, that I've wanted people to get is just how important it is to be prepared and don't get out on the limb, don't guess. Um, that uh, when I was a kid, you know, the, the Boy Scouts motto was be prepared. And it was kind of a joke um, in a different context. Um, but you really do need to be prepared. And um, the, I, I've seen it in so many of these cases, like Hitler Diaries. And I think it's actually, I was thinking this week, it, it's a worthwhile talk to do a talk about how all these things got authenticated like Hitler, Mussolini, uh, Jack the Ripper, all these things. There were people, five or ten people in every case. You know, how did they, how did all this stuff happen? How does it go that far? Um, and I think with the, these authentications, what I really felt in writing the, the, the memoir was that I had been so traumatized early in life by really threatening, life-threatening events. Um, that nobody could push me around. And so even though I was a young kid and did not have a Harvard PhD in history, um, and during something like Hitler Diaries, uh, where there was a lot of media pressure to have answers and be entertaining, I wouldn't do it. And uh, nobody could overwhelm me with their importance and enthusiasm. Um, why I was a survivor in a lot of really bad situations that I describe in the book, uh, when others didn't, I could only conclude lucky brain wiring. You know, I didn't really, I didn't choose um, my brain. Um, but I did, having had a very uh, traumatic time when I was young, um, I did line up with a psychiatrist who wanted to be an antique stealer. So we traded time. So I did a lot of psychotherapy, and he learned how to go into the antiques business. And he and I opened an antique store uh, just outside of Harvard Square. Um, he loved antiques, and he was horrible in business. 
uh, but that was okay. I could take care of the, um, the, the business side of things. But it also led me to a great understanding of myself and, and the people around me um, and to be able to understand human nature and, and very complex situations uh, in business. Um, one of them, um, which is about as complicated as a situation could be, I was recently writing about in May uh, because I was going to do a talk in Salt Lake City um, on what people didn't know about the Mormon bombings and, and the forgeries. And there'd been a Netflix series on it. Um, and uh, I hadn't watched it because um, I knew it was entertainment. They did not want to know that the, the man who was the mur who did set the bombs and he was the front man. He didn't do the forgeries. Uh, he did do the oath of Freeman. Uh, but I, so I didn't watch it, but I did watch it for that. And I was amazed that there were so many developing pieces of information that made no sense. And they're all, everything's happening at the same time. Uh, they were logical. Um, and they re required a complete reversal, reversal of what almost everybody thought. The key figure was the murderer. Um, but it looked like it was other people involved with business. Um, in case after case, like the Hitler Diaries, Jack the Ripper, Elvis Presley, the, the list goes on, um, Richard Nixon's White House papers and the Watergate tapes, the complexity bewildered me when I was writing about it in the memoir. I think at the time, as events are unfolding um, and, and coming at you, maybe, I, maybe it actually was because I was younger, I don't know. Um, but it was just bewildering how complex the situations were because you, you don't know what the answer is. Um, and you don't, I mean, I knew the Hitler diaries were fake, but the, my job was to prove it one way or the other for, for the readers of Newsweek and then CBS um, News. Um, and, you know, and I look at stuff like Nixon's White House papers and Watergate, that was for real money. Uh, the government had to pay Nixon because it was a taking. He owned his papers. It doesn't matter that that's illogical. Um, but up until Jimmy Carter, each president owned their own papers. Uh, and since they took them, they had to pay for them. And that was my job in this. Um, the, um, um, the whole thing was kind of summed up when Shoy and I met with Bill and Melinda Gates and uh, talked about what they wanted to do and the schedule that they wanted, and they wanted a library of 25,000 books was what there was space for. And so, of course, he wanted it done. And although what that meant, it got heavily discussed. Um, but I agreed to build a library, about 25,000 volumes, deliver it on the shelves in 11 months precisely, on a precise date. And I never forgot, Shirley said to me, and everything would be cataloged. And Shirley said to me um, that night that, that she knew I took on really complex things, but she had absolutely no idea how we were going to go from nothing to a shelf library in 11 months. And I whispered to her that it was a secret. I had absolutely no idea how we were going to do it. Uh, but I knew that we would, and we did on the precise day. Uh, not only was everything in a central catalog, um, but we had to have the bookcases built because his contractor built them the wrong size. And we had some shelves that were only three inches deep. And so I took books that were used books and had them all cut so they were only three inches deep and put rods through them. And so we had several bays like this. And when people coming into the library would ask me, I always said, well, this is for very shallow um, interest books. <laughs> but there actually is an answer to this uh, to some degree. Uh, and it's the D-Day plans in World War II um, to have simultaneous operations going on, uh, 12, 14 operations all going on at the same exact time. 
and how they're uh, synchronized and how they're dependent on each other and if things go wrong, how things change. And we had things go wrong, going wrong uh, with Gates. Everything was unloaded in 45 minutes uh, with, by a crane down the hill. And the stuff was coming down faster than what we had timed. And so we, the backups. And, but, you know, there was a plan uh, as to what to do. Um, and the biggest thing, I think, was wanting to demystify success. Um, you know, all the people, when they talk about luck, and they think it can't happen to them. And they're right if they just sit there and wait it to fall out of the sky. Um, one time we had a development director for our World War II museum. And, God, he just didn't, he didn't last. But he just didn't get off his chair and get out there and looking for money. So I took $100 bills and I put them on fish wire and I taped them on his ceiling. So the money was just coming down from the sky where evidently he thought it all came from. Um, but the, the dealers telling me about luck, I found really annoying. I used to go to Europe and I, I, I didn't really live in Boston nor in London and I'd be back and forth every three, we three weeks. And I would go to every dealer in Paris, in Brussels, Amsterdam, and London, um, rare book dealers. And it was unusual if I found anything to buy because um, I was there so frequently. So it had to be something new that came in. Um, but my unforgettable example was a rare book dealer. Uh, hardly ever found anything. But one day they had a Sir Walter Raleigh document framed, signed by him, and it was an important document. And I, I, I took it with me uh, as I went around to other dealers, and everybody saw it was Raleigh. Um, and they all said, oh, my God, you're so lucky. And I said, you know, how often do you go to dealers? Oh, I've never gone to one. I said, oh, well, that's why you're not lucky. Um, but I remember I did start telling people that I ran around so much that if it did fall out of the sky, I'd catch it. Um, but I want, my, I want my memoirs to encourage people. Uh, I talk a, about a lot of problems, the death of our son, um, and how we survived. Um, that's been a chapter I have gotten a lot of, of nice letters about. Um, and, you know, things are different today than when I was doing all this stuff, but take today's technology and understand it, which I don't do. Um, but um, the, and, and my memoir is very specific to historical artifacts. You know, that's, the, um, that's what I know about. Um, and the, the, the personal benefit, I, it's really worth evaluating your life at different points. Um, you know, I, I looked at this of, of almost 70 years. And um, a, um, a book review had a very amusing headline where I said that I felt guilty that I had, I had gotten out of a very successful rare coin business and went into historical letters and documents, which was very difficult to make profitable um, when I was 17. And they just parried it as, you know, imagine having this problem when kids don't do anything these days. Um, but I think just the, the, the sense of looking at your whole life and what's gone on, um, it, it, um, it, it, I, I don't, wouldn't say that it's empowering. It's not empowering. Um, but you get a sense of, of what you've done and who you are. Um, Shirley told me not to quote uh, this person, but John Eisenhower told me that uh, his father, Dwight, um, when he would get bad press or have trouble with Congress, he'd sit in the Oval Office and pound his fist into the desk and say, God damn it, I won the war. That was enough. Well, I felt that way, <laughs> I got to say. Um, you know, for 60 some odd years, I did all these things. Um, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm really proud of, and I have no idea how I did it all. I, 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 don't, I was just driven. 
and um, the um, I think that the uh, the other thing that really stood out for me is that almost everything in my book is positive, not the frauds, and that's another matter. Uh, and it's the victims more than the, the the forgers were really good. They analyzed their victims, um, what they would want to believe, and uh, and they tailored the frauds really well. I, I'm going to do a talk at Grow in. in uh, when I'm having a big forgery exhibition. I'm gonna talk about that. But in terms of the collectors and the, and the people, um, most of them have become friends and, with, and long after the collecting, I mean, they, they've got everything they can have and there's no business involved. Um, and there are actually quite a few pictures in there of people that people are really surprised to um, see because I don't think they ever thought of them as people. You know, I mean, they're not dressed up. We're hiking, and um, uh, we followed Lewis and Clark um, by canoe and horseback and hiking uh, across Montana. And there's some well-known um, and very interesting people in the group. Um, so th that they were really great memories um, that came back to me, um, and the. Yeah, you know, just reminiscing on on some of the dealers here who created big libraries. That um, I was doing something at Virginia at the Rare Book School when it first moved there, and I said something about Waller Barrett, and that's the name of the library. And it was like, oh my God, you mean he was a real person? Well, yeah. I mean, I just happened to have started so young that um, that I, I can remember all of these people. Um, and the dealers were really nice to me. So the whole thing, the whole thing, um, I mean, I forgot all about the, I went to Lilly Library, Bloomington, Indiana. There is no campground. And, and so I got thrown out of a Howard Johnson's motel for cooking in my room. Um, but um, I mean, I can't remember where I went on to from there. Um, in, in terms of traveling. But it basically is, has been all really good memories and, and, and good people, good people in history and, and good people to be associated with. Um, I mean, history is the answer to everything. You know, I think it's the, it's the grounding that the communities need. Um, I'm very proud of work I do on a museum that nobody no outsider can see. And Shirley asked me one time um, why I spent a lot of time working on a museum that's in the headquarters of CIA. And so people can't go to it unless you work at CIA. But it, it's, it, that's very much about creating a sense of community for all these people who can't talk about what they do. But they can look about at what people did in the past. And um, the, the museum, which is two sections, is, is OSS, World War II. And that's what I started with. And I knew a lot of the people. So I have lots of pictures of people, and, and it's very people-oriented. And, and the spy gadgets. I mean, nothing beats what the CIA has. Um, my favorite, which is on display there now, uh, is the dragonfly. And it's a dragonfly, and it's that big, except it has microphones and a TV camera, and it's flown remotely. So the dragonfly can be controlled, and it can land someplace and pick up the conversations. Um, it's absolutely amazing what goes on there. But to me, you know, they can, people can walk in there um, and they can see what people have done in the past. And then the other day, um, two days ago, we were talking about a meeting in the spring um, to um, uh, make some changes with OSS. And the, the CIA person behind all of this said, you know, beyond what I say, there's also the element that people right now who are in the Middle East in on really difficult circumstances, um, gathering intelligence on both sides. Um, nobody will know what they did, 
but they will know that in 25 years there'll be an exhibit about what they did. And so they historically will not be forgotten, just as you look at the Cuban Missile Crisis and uh, Francis Gary Powers getting shot down in his U-2 uh, plane and, and um, all of those things that have gone on um, in, in our lifetime. Anyhow, thank you. I'm open to questions or discussion. So for the... For those who are in the room, uh, I'm going to ask one or two questions, but then we'll open it up to questions from people in the room. And we also will be taking questions from our YouTube audience. Uh, John Garcia in the back has a mic to bring to people in the room. And then Wolverton will be reading questions that we get from, from YouTube. And I think I wanted to go back. I, I really enjoyed the book because I enjoyed reading about what was behind the successes. And one of the stories you tell early in the book is you're, you're 15 years old and you're traveling, you're in a car to California and Mexico and then a few years later, you're going to Jamaica and the Bahamas as a 17-year-old or 18-year-old. And I found myself asking, and this is before airplane travel was even routine, where'd you get the nerve? I don't know. Uh, quite seriously, I wish I did because I would really like to tell, I call them my kids, uh, 30 kids every year in the Spark uh, program. Um, I didn't know I couldn't do it. And I didn't, you know, I, I from where I came from, um, and I did describe it in there, uh, in the neighborhood of my father's drugstore, the kids I played with, they all aspired to something similar. They were not going to get caught as often as their father did. They weren't going to spend all that time in prison. They were going to get away with it. So I'm coming from this weird background, and I didn't know I couldn't do it. I didn't know um, that it took a lot of nerve to go into Barclays Bank in Kingston, Jamaica, and, um, and put the bank manager on my payroll for the same amount as Barclays Bank paid him. Um, to make my coin operation work. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, I mean, it's like, what else would you do in life? Uh, you know, you gotta, I got to take chances. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing. There was no set thing as to how life was going to unfold. And uh, if I didn't make my own way, um, I wasn't going anyplace. Yeah. I mean, the theme of the book is this combination of taking chances and doing your homework. I mean, that's, that's what runs throughout it for me, that it may seem like taking chances, but you're always studying. You're always, you know, and part of it seems to be curiosity. I mean, there's, you have a chapter about when you got interested in antiquity, a whole different world from what you had been collecting and, and dealing as manuscripts. It, is that simply because you're curious about a different part of the world, a different time in history? Well, how did all this unfold? How did people start writing? Yeah. How did pictorial, you know, it started with Sumerian symbols before pictographs. Um, and it just was endless curiosity, I think, about, I mean, I, I took on Richard Nixon. I was retired from appraisals. I didn't do this kind of thing anymore. Um, and I had strict rules on, on my end um, with it, um, but I was really curious about Richard Nixon. You know, I, I didn't like him. You know, I mean, everybody had the same attitude. I, I didn't like him. I had met him actually, and uh, he's socially extremely awkward. And um, um, I thought it would be really interesting to see what's there. And I set a time limit of two weeks that I couldn't afford to spend any more time than that. And um, I spent a lot of it arguing with his lawyers. Um, and I didn't understand that they want, I, I put in there that I thought I could settle the case. I thought the Justice Department would agree to whatever I said because I did that work for them. So, you know, they know me and they know that I'm not going to advocate something that I don't think is real. Um, it was a mistake 
of my part that I didn't realize Nixon's lawyers wanted to go to trial. Because you don't get, you don't get a big legal bill unless you go to trial. And there was a lot of money involved because their legal fees were going to come out of whatever the government paid for the papers. Um, and I, yeah, I put it in there, and the, the distribution, I think they got nine million or 12 million out of it. it was, I, I didn't, I was done, as I said, in two weeks. That was it. And they didn't want me to, to settle this. They wanted me to increase what I said from 30 million to 45, and it, the money wasn't there. I mean, you couldn't have raised 45, in my view. So we parted. Um, in an unfriendly way. So I put in there, they, did, they didn't want to pay me uh, what I wanted, and then we really battled over it, but they did. So I put a check stub from them uh, in the memoir, and uh, I charged more than they got per day. So, <laughs> and it was deliberate. Um, I, it seems to me, as you describe how you moved early in your life from rare coins coins to manuscripts, but there's something about the manuscript that connects us emotionally with the history, with the people who behind that, and that was what initially hooked you and got, got you interested. Well, in the, yeah, the, the, I, think, I think at that point, without being consciously aware of it, um, was the sense these are real people. Um, I got stuck one time with, I had had a very tiring time in, in, on a ranch in, in Dallas, the weekend's over. I'm back in Dallas and a friend of mine really wanted me to meet somebody who really wanted to meet me. It's like, oh, uh, you know, all right, I'll have dinner with them. And I got out see us in the hotel and the guy said, I hear you're so interesting, I invited some friends. 50 of them, <laughs> and he got a private dining room so I could speak. Oh, no. oh, and I'm looking at a group of people. I have nothing to say. I mean, I'm drained out. And uh, so I started off looking at a crowd of 50 and 60-year-olds. I said, you know what you learn reading other people's mail? Everybody's teenagers are a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> they did it, you know. And then, I mean, you start talking about other things because all these people... In addition to having all these incredible thoughts, they're real people, and they have concerns and anxieties and worries, and uh, they're not sure how something's going to turn out that they're working on. Um, one of the greatest letters that that I had um, uh, was a George was a George Washington letter four days after he becomes president saying to somebody who was very friendly with us, one of the signers of the Declaration, um, that he was so worried about accepting the presidency because everyone put him on such an undeserved pedestal that all he could do was fail. He could never live up to what people's expectations were. And they thought he won the American Revolution. He didn't. The soldiers won the American Revolution. And that was put with a letter that written out by Dwight Eisenhower as president saying, I had no idea George Washington felt that way. But that's exactly how I felt when both the Democrats and the Republicans wanted to nominate me. You know, that all I can do is fail. I mean, I, and he said, I didn't win World War II. You know, the soldiers did. And, um, you know, I think that that theme is, is something that really interests me. And I think one of the reasons I have gotten very friendly personally with so many people um, who are put on pedestals um, is that I treat them like people. And I, 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 I'm ne I've never been in awe of anybody. Um, because they're a person. I could be in awe of what they've done, but I, the only one really, I, Harry Truman really impressed me. That, that I, I talk about that in the book. I met him. He spent a lot of time with me. He really answered questions honestly. Um, he was a really genuine guy, and I thought he was really amazing um, and totally unpretentious. So is Bill Gates, actually. And I put all that in there. The, the
The public and private, Bill and Melinda Gates, are totally different people. The Microsoft Bill Gates, I never wanted to know. Um, but at home was a whole other matter. They totally unpretentious. And I think that that's, that's been, that's what attracted me with the letters. I started with Revolutionary War letters. Um, and I was interested in what people considered ordinary content because I thought that was humanizing content. And, um, made it very interesting. Yeah. Let's open it up for folks in the audience. Nan, do you have a question from, yes. from YouTube? Please. Yes, we do have uh, a question from Terry Marsh who asks if you could please talk more about why you say history is the answer to everything. I think that, that um, you see people in similar circumstances if you rarely analyze it in human terms, not in the you know, technology, not the, the facts. Um, but that, that human history doesn't change all that much. I mean, at one end of our house, we have a very unusual house. It's all collections. And uh, at one end of the house uh, is the ancient world, and there are two Egyptian books of the dead. Um, the other end of the house is the American West, and there are Indian spiritual objects. And the Indians are concerned about the afterlife, which is what the Book of the Dead is all about. And I think there are all these human things that connect people. And I think you can find people in, in similar circumstances. And I think there's some reassuring, I, although frankly, I, I couldn't say today that that's it's never been like this before. Um, but the thing, things did work out. Um, and um, so that's why I think that there's a grounding um, in history. And I, I think it's very sad that an awful lot of people suffer with basic human feelings thinking they are unique to them only, and there's something wrong with them. And if people would really talk about things, they'd find out everybody, you know, like everybody's uh, teenagers, um, that kind of thing. Um, it, uh, it unites people. Great. Yeah, Erin. Hi. Um, I'm wondering about how you learned how to look. You talked about not having a formal education, so how did you go from, you know, not that kind of formal training, which many of us in the profession seek out and, and need, um, to being working for the IRS and the Justice Department authenticating stuff and being able to say, like, I know why this is this thing or it's not that thing. I think I, I didn't like the way people always said, I just know. But they couldn't explain it. And I wanted to create situations um, in which people would understand why I had the opinions that I did. And I always looked at it, you've got a judge or you've got a jury, whether or not you did or not. I used to say to people who authenticated things kind of offhandedly, you know, are you really prepared to go to court when you get sued over this? Oh, my God, no, they're not going to go to I said, want to bet? You know, you get subpoenaed. And um, it, uh, I, 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 I wrote the, 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 the reference book on forging history, and it's breaking down every aspect of historical documents and how to determine whether they're um, fakes or whether they're almost certainly genuine. I, I kind of worked everything from the basis of logic. I didn't want to follow what other people said because I didn't think they really had thought it out. And they were right most of the time. I mean, things would, could be dead obvious. Um, but I wanted to build my own way of doing it. And there were people who disagreed. Um, I mean, one of my things, and it was the, the what I did with, with uh, Nixon. Um, you don't do anything like that individually. It's what the whole overall concept. Question was, how much money could, could be available? Well, that's the way I would treat it if I was selling it. You know, and uh, I mean, I had a law firm say they weren't hiring me for a situation because they didn't agree that you had to be able to show there was a market. Well, I disagreed. You know, I think 
if, if, if you couldn't identify that there was any market, then you had to have a whole hypothetical that what's the probability there's a market? And then that's a factor. And if it, you know, 0.6, if it's 65% chance there's a market, well, then the overall value gets reduced by a third. It's only worth two thirds. I mean, that's the way you would price something. You know, what are all the probabilities? So I just, I, I wanted to develop my own way and, and my own way of communicating uh, with people. Um, and, you know, you have to, um, there's an art to it. You know, there is, because you can piss off a jury, but they get you. You know, I mean, they're voting. And uh, so if you talk down to them or, you know, I mean, it's, it's people, you know, person to person kind of stuff. And uh, that's where I, that's the kind of answers I wanted to get, but I, I generally didn't get them. Too much mystique in elitism. And um, it doesn't work with me, and, and I, I don't like it. Uh, I always liked opposing lawyers who went to very fancy law schools because they <laughs> knew they were going to win. <laughs> they didn't have to prepare for everything because they had the God-given right, um, and uh, they they were really a charm. <laughs> 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 a friend of mine, a close-up magician, was doing all this stuff one day at, at the uh, club that I belong to in San Francisco. And these four guys asked, you know, they really wanted to see some of his stuff. And he said, uh, after a few minutes, he said, oh, all of you must be from Stanford. They said, yeah. And they said, well, and you're all professors. And they said, how did you know? And he said, you're so easy to fool. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, Ken, I want to ask you a follow-up question about uh, those who know the market value of something versus someone who knows I guess, the book value of something. So what do you make of the current rules that the IRS has come up with about qualifications of appraisals, because it, appraisers? Because it seems to me they've sort of pushed the rare book dealers who make their money from transactions to be less qualified than those who just do appraisals alone. Is that true? It is true. And, and do you, what do you think about that? Well, I, I describe those appraisers as the people who imagine what people like me would actually do. Exactly. <laughs> and, and that, I mean, it's true. It's the dealer, you know, who, who makes a statement. Not these, I mean, they're two-bit people. You know, they're churning out standard phrases, all the same crap all the time. And, and they're never right. Um, and why did the IRS make that? Oh, well, it's the Society of American Appraisers, I think. You know, they lobby. And, uh, and the IRS has problems getting people um, to, to do work. And, uh, you know, it's, it's supposedly, you know, it's all one on paper, but, um, but not really. I mean, when they, um, the whole thing is a business, and I mean that in, in the complete sense. The IRS once said to me, what they love to do is audit a pizza seller because they can look at how much cheese was bought, how much flour was bought. They can then figure out how much it takes to make a pizza. So that gives you the number of pizzas that were made based on the supplies. It's all cash, or used to be. Um, and then you can figure out if you buy X amount of cheese, you should be declaring sales of X amount of money, and nobody is. But there are 100,000 pizza makers in America, so they nail one person. But now they audit every pizza baker, and they know if you've spent this much money on cheese. They don't really want these kind of cases either. And I think people don't understand. You don't have to accept what they say. You know, if, if you challenge it, and I mean, you have to, a right to end up in tax court. You know, nobody wants the. I mean, you know, if you're the taxpayer, you got to pay for it. Um, but they don't want. They don't want to end up in tax court. Um, it's a one-off case. Um, but but I think those appraisers. I mean, they bought the BS line hmm. from the appraisers. I'm sure I'm not qualified. I've won the only cases on both sides <laughs> to the penny. But you know, I mean, I, I don't want to do 
um, anything. Um, uh, but I think that's the answer. We have time for maybe one more question, if folks, please, Bob, up, up, up Mike, up here. Thanks, John. What about the issue of uh, auction houses that can validate or not an, an appraisal? Because it seems like, you know, you could, if, if you appraise something that then does go to auction, that sort of proves whether you were right or not, or, or does it not? It proves it on that day. And that and that's all, and um, I mean it, it's a it's a fine way to do things, and um, auctions can go sour. The Sotheby's just had a big one, where the catalog was not out two weeks before. Finest Renaissance book collection, there is, and most of it didn't sell, and the catalog wasn't out. And um, the sale, which was like maybe October 1st, and during Bibliophiles meeting, which was in Paris, everybody was talking about it. And one of the French dealers uh, said to, to uh, Booker, the, whose collection it was, you know, I have a lot of collectors who would love to be interested, but I don't have any catalogs to show them. And, and the sale bombed. So. What was it worth if the catalog had been out four weeks in advance? So, you I mean, you can make your arguments. Um, you know, I think that uh, auction records, um, uh, they can also take off uh, in terms of sailing high. And you might not get that circumstance again. Because if you think of the auction um, psychology, uh, it, I, I used to do mountaineering. In mountaineering, everything you thought, you thought of everything in 120 foot section. Forget the fact you're 2,000 feet up on the rock face. <laughs> it's 120 feet, you know, that, that's your range. And that's like an auction, you know, where, um, you know, it's one more bid. It's just another thousand, and then mm -hmm. another thousand. You forget that you're at 20,000. <laughs> and people don't always. Um, want it if, let's say, somebody backs out and they, the underbidder can lose their enthusiasm, you know, and then and sinks down to reality. So it, it can, I think, if you're doing a, a, an appraisal that matters, um, you've got to take all the different things into consideration. Uh, I was talking to someone yesterday who has a a big um, collection on one state in the West, and it's the best collection. And you'd never put that at auction. I mean, it's got to be one price. Uh, it's a concept. It's an opportunity. Um, you've got to have time for an institution to raise money. Maybe that's a year. Um, but I mean, you'd be crazy to put that at auction. You know, that would give you the one shot at one day. And without the raising of money, without the building uh, up of um, anticipation, sometimes that does work. There was one Western collection that just hit it all correctly. And um, they, um, they, it, they did really well. Um, I think that they, uh, as a major buyer, I didn't like how much I paid, but <laughs> uh, the people next to me and I were bidding, and I didn't know who in the world they were. And so between sessions, I invited them out to lunch. And I said, I'm Ken Rendell. I collect Western Americana. And the guy said, I'm Clint Gilcrease. I'm from Pinedale, Wyoming. I said, Jesus Christ, don't tell me gas has been discovered under Pinedale. He said, yes, I represent the, the local sublet county historical museum, which we're going to build. <laughs> uh, with gas money. Mm -hmm. So on that day, you know, the, the owner, the creator of the collection was deceased at 102. Um, and they, the estate came out fantastically. So they, you know, that, that represented the discovery of gas in Pinedale, Wyoming. <laughs> and if gas had not been discovered in Pinedale, I would have gotten everything at a, probably a, a tenth of the price. <laughs> So it, it, it's, it, you can, 
you, you have to really look at the whole. I mean, the Nixon thing all depended on one thing. How much money could be raised to buy the collection? And that was determined by Mari Stans, who was the head of the committee to reelect Nixon, who raised the, the staggering amount of money for the reelection. And he raised the money to build the Nixon Library, the physical building. And he raised $30 million. And he gave me his list of the people, put up the $30 million, and I knew quite a few of them. So I called them and I said, you know, if the papers and Watergate tapes are available, um, what would you put in? And they'd put basically the same. So I could extrapolate that out to I could come up with $30 million. And, and I insisted on giving the government the Watergate tapes. And his lawyer didn't like it when I said, look, I said, no judge is going to agree that Richard Nixon gets everything he asked for, because he can't go home and tell his wife that. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, there's got to be a concession. And the Watergate tapes are hard to um, uh, estimate the value. And they said, well, we want, we want enough. I said, well, I did come up with the value. I said. Remember, good taste is not in the tax code. <laughs> and I said, what I would do, and I analyzed it this way, is I would cut the tapes up. And I would put them by words and phrases in lucite blocks. And I'd sell them on shopper image. <laughs> the word the was forty nine ninety five. dollars uh, When he was swearing, it was two hundred fifty, dollars which was very frequent. You know, in a full sentence that you could get on the lucite block could be four ninety nine ninety five. dollars And he said, you're talking about the former president of the United States. And, and this is when it was broken down. And I said, I'm talking about the unindicted co-conspirator of Watergate. I knew it was over. You know, I mean, we weren't going to. Uh, it wasn't going to get any better from there. But, I, but it's, it's complicated. And I always said, my, my, what I'm saying is the best educated guess, and it is a guess. You, you can't be that precise. You know, it, no, I mean, I had one. I said, if the other side is five times what I'm saying, I don't want to challenge it. I have no, it was box. Neither one of us knew what was in it. The IRS didn't know what was in the box. I mean, this was a crazy situation. It was a big settlement of a legal case. And um, you, you, it's a guess. Um, it's, it's imprecise. So even if can, the can, auction can, establishes the value, that's just the value that day. Yeah. I mean, that's the, yeah. I mean, you, you, can, you can make the case. There was something recently, somebody was trying to tell me, um, oh, it was a guy bought, um, um, logbook of the co-pilot of the Enola Gay. It was at Heritage. They estimated a million two to a million five. He bought it for six hundred thousand, and he wanted to get nine hundred thousand out of it. He wanted me to sell it. I said the value is six hundred. He said, "Oh, Steve Ivey said you know it's worth a million two. I said, "Well, tell him to buy it. <laughs> you know, he yeah. just sold. That's the price." I said, "You can't give it away. You'd have to show." that the auction was held on a day when the internet crashed and you know, there was some big terrorist attack that changed the sense of security in the country. I mean, you know, I, so you can't really argue in that case, but I think it was overpriced at 600, so I mean, I didn't think it was worth that. Um, Ken Rendell, thank you so much for this conversation and for joining us tonight. Thank you. I want to thank all of you who are here, both in the room and in our YouTube audience. Uh, the program, this program will be on our YouTube channel after, so please recommend it to your friends. For those of you who are here in person tonight, our friends at Tidepool Book, Books are selling copies of Safeguarding History out in the lobby. Please feel free to pick one up. Um, this is our last public program of 2023, but we're planning a terrific lineup for 2024, including programs on New Year's ephemera that we're doing about a week after New Year's Day. Uh, we have a concert in Antiquarian Hall by the Worcester Chamber Music Society in early February. Several of the programs are already listed on our website. More is coming, so please stay tuned to AmericanAntiquarian.org, and you can watch other previous programs on our YouTube channel tonight. Ken, thank you so much. Thank you. Wish you all happy holidays and a good start to the new year. Thank you. Thank you.